Say hello to everyone. I'm your host, Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. Uh, welcome back. I'm happy and uh, pleased to present as our guest today, uh, Jelana Harris, who's a full-time lecturer at the Columbia School of Social Work, and also Ovita Williams, who's an as associate um, director of field education at the school. So. Uh, Dr. Harris, Dr. Williams, welcome to Social Impact Live. Thank you. Glad to Thank be you. here. Thank you, Richard. Pleasure. Um, I know we'll be talking about your work uh, doing a mini institute uh, to address uh, um, anti-Black racism um, at Columbia University for Columbia faculty um, in just a, a moment. But uh, before we start, I just want to acknowledge um, some of the people that we've got tuning in today um, from Appleton, Wisconsin, from Belleville, New Jersey, Hudson Valley, Austin, Texas, San Diego, Ypsilanti, Michigan, Orlando, Florida. So everybody, please welcome uh, uh, to our show and uh, great to have you here. Um, yeah, let me just remind everybody that we do save the last 10 minutes of the program for Q&A. So you've got uh, a box to submit your questions and uh, I look forward to posing them to our panelists um, um, during the last part of our show today. So in any case, let's uh, turn it over to uh, Jelana and Ovita. Um, I wanted to just first maybe get a sense a little bit of you know your background in social work um, professionally and so on and how did you sort of get into doing this work um, with regard to uh, the mini institute and and so on so um, Jelana would you like to start yeah sure so um, my research focuses uh, quite a bit on anti-blackness and looking at approaches to liberation. Um, specifically, I'm looking at intersectionality in Black women, um, their experiences with overlapping oppressions, um, the essentialization of Black women, controlling images, cultural scripts. Uh, and so that was uh, that's really what my area of focus is. Um, and I've been teaching in the area of uh, courses around power, racism, oppression, and privilege. So um, coming to Columbia a few years ago, um, began working in that area here as well and was invited to participate in the, in the Mini Institute. All right, thank you. And um, I just uh, want to note that uh, um, you do have two other colleagues uh, who worked on this institute with you, um, Professor Courtney Cogburn, I think, and also uh, uh, Zulika Henderson, uh, another yeah. one of our uh, full-time lecturers in discipline here at the School of Social Work. So just wanted yeah. to give them a shout out and, and a nod as well. So, and Ovita, um, a little bit yeah. maybe about your background and how you came yes, to do this kind of work? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, I just um, want to start with just growing up being a Black woman in the United States. And I grew up in Brooklyn, Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Uh, it was a very Hasidic Jewish neighborhood and Caribbean neighborhood. So, race and race relations were just a part of my lived experiences. But it wasn't until I went to college that, uh, which was a predominantly white institution, very much like Columbia University's campus, um, that it was clear to me that racism and its impact on me um, and the black community was something that I felt very much I needed to like really pay attention to. So I took some courses in undergrad on race and sociology. Uh, and fast forward, going to Columbia University School of Social Work, interestingly enough, I don't recall back in the 90s, coursework on anti-Black racism specifically. Um, but it was in 2005 when I came back to Columbia University that I started to do a series of workshops on facilitating critical conversations around race, gender, sexual orientation, and different parts of our intersecting identities that I started to really dig into what it means for, ha for us to have these, these challenging critical conversations. And I was doing that work with a colleague, a white woman, Dr. Cheryl Franks, who's done a lot of work around white privilege. So as a black woman doing this work with a white woman, 
really encouraging people to sit in the different ways that they present around their multiple identities was actually pretty liberating and fascinating to say the least. So I have been doing those kinds of facilitation of workshops for our field instructors and social work for students. Um, and it really is incredible how people are able to shift and move from the ideologies and beliefs and biases if just getting in a room together to talk about these issues. So I've been doing that and it's both rewarding and um, challenging, but really important work. So, and then in the last few years at the School of Social Work, I've been working on the Decolonizing Social Work course, which Dr. Harris and I now convene. And that is a course that every incoming MSW student takes around power, race, oppression, privilege, or a prop lens. And so teaching that and developing that course um, really led to now being able to do something like this mini institute for the um, university, which is pretty exciting. So happy to also be invited to do that. Thank you, Ovita. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, that course, right, of decolonizing social work. And Dr. Harris, you're also uh, involved with that. And I think it sort of sets the stage for this, this mini institute and, and, and how you became uh, or came to work with the provost's office uh, in developing a training. Um, what, what was, what's your experience uh, been like, Jelana, um, teaching this uh, course on decolonizing social work um, for you personally, I guess, but also w what you've seen in terms of student reaction and so on? Yeah, so um, the Decolonizing Social Work course is, a, is such a powerful course. I think um, students are coming in um, from different backgrounds and different experiences with this work, really trying to understand, particularly for students of color, what their relationship is to this and, and um, you know, making sure that this course is not a, a course that's focused on um, white students and white folks, right, beginning to understand um, these concepts, but really integrating all of the students in the course and being able to move past this idea of intellectualizing these concepts and really dig deep into their critical self-reflection and understanding who they are and understanding ways that they are perpetuating anti-Blackness um, in ways that they are participating in and moving through these systems, um, really beginning to interrogate what's happening in their uh, uh, organizations, um, what's happening in their field placements, um, taking a critical examination of these things, um, problematizing um, assessment approaches, right? So really, expecting and asking them to do deeper level work where they're really pull, uh, pulling back layers I and mean, examining themselves in a really uh, meaningful and critical way that I think that students are not necessarily used to. Uh, particularly, I think coming to an Ivy League uh, institution, they're really focused on this um, uh, very institutional way of like learning and this course is really asking them to move past that it's really asking them to um, to dig into who they are right to to think about their biases to think about their schema to think about their worldview examine that and look at how it how it's showing up right for them um, and how they're walking through the world and what that's going to mean for them in their practice so I find that students really really um, ch they're challenged by this but they embrace this right and, and um, the importance of it in terms of our work well, I certainly can, can see how social work students uh, would and should embrace this kind of material. Um, I'm fascinated to hear now what the response of Columbia faculty was um, as you work with the provost to, to develop this mini institute. And I think uh, you, you uh, conducted it this past summer. So how did it get started, uh, Ovita? Was it something that uh, the office of the provost reached out to our school or? Yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, Richard. So yes, um, so Dean um, Dennis Mitchell reached out to to uh, Dean Melissa Begg at School of Social Work and actually said, you know, I hear you all have been doing something over there <laughs> at the School of Social Work and would, would you be interested in coming to um, do some work on the university level? So with um, Dean Carmelo, who's our Diversity, Equity and Inclusion um, Dean at the School of Social Work and um, Dean Begg, 
really coordinating with Dennis Mitchell's office to bring us on board to do this work. Um, so I think that, and let me just say that the course itself, the DSW course, Decolonizing Social Work, is now four years old. Um, and so there has been a lot of work, a lot of effort, all of what Dr. Harris described about how this course came to be. And we're now at a point at the School of Social Work we, where we've used the past year or so to suffuse a power, race, oppression, privilege lens into the core of our curriculum. So that really meant that over the past year or so, faculty at the School of Social Work looking at syllabi, looking at course learning objectives, reading material, and really um, making sure that a power, race, oppression, privilege lens is really infused into the fabric of the curriculum. Still work to be done, but that's the direction we've been moving in. Um, so to be able to work with the university on this is just absolutely incredible. Um, and I think really shows that you know, with the hard work that we've put in, um, we're now seeing that um, folks are saying, how are you doing that? What are the ways that you're able to do this work around anti-Black racism, undoing white supremacy culture in the climate, in the way that our country globally, we've not been able to really have those difficult conversations. Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's wonderful. And and uh, I have my notes here and I don't think we're going to have enough time to really delve into the full content of what was three uh, separate seminars, right? Uh, examining this global moment, framing an anti-Black racism agenda. The second one, looking at positionality and engaging in self-reflection. And the third, developing a personal and institutional anti-racist action plan. So I love right. that it finishes, you know, with an action plan and that we're moving from, you know, sort of a more abstract uh, academic discussion, right, um, to developing uh, these plans to address these issues on an individual and also on an institutional collective level. So absolutely. Yeah. So I know there's a, a, a lot of material in there, but I'm fascinated about the process and what that was like for you. How do you facilitate these conversations? Um, what was difficult? I mean, what was rewarding about doing this mini institute? Yeah, I'll jump in here. So I, I think, okay. I think one of the things we really wanted to focus on is um, encouraging folks to really examine this moment that we're in right now, right? And really think about um, why some folks are experiencing this moment as new, why would, there's this tendency to sort of think about racism, particularly anti-Black racism, as being sort of incarcerated and regulated in history, right? And so really being able to sit with the idea that this is an ongoing experience that's been happening and, and um, the work that folks um, are doing to sort of not see this, right? And so first, we kind of want to put that out there, right? And sit with that um, and then really begin to sort of do the work of seeing um, how you're showing up in your um, in your classrooms, right, in your organizations and in, in, in the institution at Columbia University um, and what it looks like to really um, interrogate, right, your practices, interrogate these policies, understand where white supremacy culture is showing up in, in um, these areas um, and what what it really is going to take and what you're willing to do to make these shifts and these changes right we're not talking about lip service or just language and policies right but really thinking about how policies are experienced by different folks right taking an intersectional approach to, to, to examining this um, and really thinking about like what, what are you willing to do what are you willing to give up to to make sure that this that this happened that this work moves forward wonderful absolutely yeah, and I, and I think that having this be a group dialogue is huge because people are witnessing each other's narratives, each other's stories, each, each other's lived experiences. Um, and so that kind of public, if you will, uh, conversation takes it outside of the self and really puts it into the space you know, where people are listening and tuning into others. So we do a lot of modeling when you ask about facilitating these conversations. Um, each of us, the four of us, um, Dr. Carburn, Dr. Henderson, Dr. Harris, and myself, we had two different groups. And so two of us facilitated each of those groups over the three sessions. And so the t having that model, that co-facilitation model, really supports an ability for each partner in that 
facilitation dyad to um, bring out uh, and listen to what's happening in the space and be able to bring it to the surface. So if there's something that we heard that was happening, it's really being able to say, I hear you saying something right now. I think it's important. Let's talk about it. So that support, I think someone in the chat asked, like, how did you take care of yourself? We took care of each other, honestly. The four of us really met before, after, and somewhere in between to really sit with this as four women of color to really sit with what came up um, in our mind, body, and spirit. So I'm glad that question is asked because if you don't have that kind of connection and to be able to support one another, it's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff. Yeah, and, and I imagine, yeah, it, it, it takes its toll, uh, sort of trying to create and hold that kind of space for people. Um, and uh, I don't mean to uh, sort of any, break any confidentiality or anything else that um, you established um, in, in doing these groups, but I'm just wondering if in some way you can sort of share maybe a powerful moment that came out of this, this institute for you um, as you were discussing things, maybe an aha moment for some people that you saw, or just for yourself, uh, you know, what, what, what what is it that, that supports you and brings you back to doing this very difficult work? So yeah, um, yeah who'd like to jump in? I'm gonna say very quickly um, yeah. that there's an exercise that we did and um, I have to say this is Dr. Henderson's um, brain child, if you will. We asked people to create a timeline for themselves, right? And on that timeline, right, from their time at Columbia University, for example, what, what was their understanding of anti-black racism you know what was their understanding of racism in, in in this country and their lives and their experiences and seeing what people thought before george floyd was murdered and then after was for me uh, an aha moment if you will or a critical moment or a sad moment or maybe even a moment that maybe we can move forward from this. So that was incredible for me to see people really take a look at why now, or that was the question was why now? Why is anti-racist work important now in the midst of all the pandemics that we're going through? And that conversation for me was really, um, really interesting to say the least. And is there an answer? I, I, can, can we explain why now? Or is that something that everyone has to answer I think for themselves? People, people had to sit with. People really had to sit with and recognize that maybe that, that they were not doing anything before, that in their dominant privileged identities, they didn't have to. They could leap over those, those mm -hmm. identities and not have to do anything. So maybe that was something that people had to really sit with. Shalana, what do you think? Yeah, I think absolutely. There was a lot of um, folks sort of centering their subjugated identities, right, and not um, wanting to sit with their privilege. I think that really allows folks to not see what's happening in our world. Um, I think it takes a lot of uh, psychological and mental gymnastics sometimes for us to do that, but the world, the, our society creates a space for that, right? It allows for us to do that. And so unless we are willing to sort of go against the grain, right, unless we are willing to really um, take do that critical work then it's very easy to sit in this world and not and not see these things right because of the narratives that are put forward um and i think you know something else that came up just sort of piggybacking on what dr williams williams said is that you know we talked about why is it that black folks really need to bleed right in order for folks mm -hmm. to really recognize this pain right so unless someone is laying bare on the floor then um we we don't seem to really um give it any relevance or any focus and i think that that was something that was really moving for folks to think about why does it take that extreme um that sort of that things to go to that extent right for for us to really want to sit and look at this and for us to be frozen in time right we, we we experienced this during the pandemic when folks couldn't leave their homes and so like there was also this this um notion that we were sort of forced to, to watch and experience this in ways that we probably wouldn't have um had the world not been shut down in the way that it was yeah i was just thinking that maybe it takes a um, a global trauma, right, um, to sort of move society in 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 some direction or another. So, um, yeah, I I want to uh, just see if we can just address some of the questions that uh, have been submitted, and uh, I think there are also some comments, and and maybe we can continue the conversation as time permits. But uh, 
the first question was, I am so inspired by both of you, Dr. Harris and Dr. Williams. I'm sure that this work takes a toll, body, mind, and spirit. How do you take care of yourselves in the process? So, Vita, you were, you were mentioning that before. So how, how do you take care of yourselves? Um, so I, I think I, I want to just jump in on, on top of what, what, what um, Dr. Williams already mentioned and just say, I think for me as a Black woman, it really requires me to let go of this idea of uh, Black respectability politics, um, the, the socialization that I've experienced in, in uh, needing to assimilate to whiteness, to seek proximity to whiteness. I think giving myself permission to, to move away from that and to relieve that um, has really been a way that I've been taking care of myself. I think, um, again, as a Black a black person living in America, there's so much effort placed on me not being black, right, and and not showing up as um, you know all my blackness, and so um, that's that's really been something that has allowed me to breathe more, um, and and constantly having to remind myself, right, of of um, the ways that that's sort of mapped onto me. Hmm. Okay. Ovita. Yeah, I mean, I think along with what Dr. Harris is saying, I think that I've had to know when I need to say no or step back or take care of, of my, myself by um, not constantly being immersed in, 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 in everything, right? Um, so, and then I think, again, I'm just going to reiterate, leaning on my colleagues, colleagues that I know are doing this work that are about anti-racist work that are also in this, that we can sit and say, you know what, that was hard, that sucked, I'm exhausted, I need a break, um, is what really helps me. Um, so, yeah. All right. Uh, second question, who have you found to be more open and amenable to change, the students or the faculty? Oh, this is an interesting question. <laughs> well, you know, I the way the DSW course got going was student activism. And so back in 2015, the student demand uh, that our students um, collectively created, one of those was to develop this a course on racism. And I had the absolute you know, pleasure of working with 15 students and Dr. Courtney Cogborn and uh, four alum, our prop leadership team, who were absolutely incredible. And it was students who pushed that. And then very, you know, what was harder was getting faculty to really understand anti-Black racism. Um, harder, but not impossible. Because like I said before, we're at a different place, um, still work to be done, but there were many a faculty meeting of having yet again another conversation on what is anti-Black racism and why it's important to really teach our students, social work students going out into the world, practicing with communities that they're serving to understand that our work has to be centered on undoing these systems, on decimating, on abolishing um, the systems that we have. So, uh, Yeah, I, I think it's a, a really complicated question and answer. Um, and maybe this question from the audience is, is, is related because it, it, it asks about uh, uh, what is our school doing for uh, indigenous people, right? And sometimes the whole notion or issue of intersectionality comes up and there are maybe some misconceptions about what intersectionality is and different interests um, uh, for different people of color and so on. So, um, so yeah, does, does your training or does the course sort of bring in that piece uh, with regard to, um, you know, other groups, indigenous and, and so on, and, and how um, this uh, relates to anti-Black racism in general? Yeah, I, Good question. I, it absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I think, um, Ovita, you could probably really speak to this um, more than, than I can, but I, the, the course does um, begin to, to ask students to, to think about, right, um, the land that we're sitting on, what that means, right? And also, um, there's definitely been a, a shift in the movement towards not just sort of, again, paying lip service and sort of doing these land acknowledgements, but really thinking about what it means um, to work um, towards liberation of these, uh, of these populations, what it means to start to think about giving back um, and what it means to take action, right? So not to just make statements, but what it means to take action. How can we get involved, right? Like how yeah. have indigenous folks been experiencing this pandemic and what does it mean for social work students to become a part of um, the process of, of, of 
working towards social justice. Um, right. And I know the school is doing a lot of work with um, the Lenape yeah. organization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yes, the first year, the, the students said, you know, we, we, it's lip service, as um, Dr. Harris is saying. And so we um, connected with the Lenape Center and have been in connection with the um, co-founders, uh, Adrian Cummins and Joe Baker, um, and Adrian came into the school a few uh, spring, a few semesters ago, and did a series on mindfulness in the indigenous community. We're looking at a course that the Lenape uh, Center, Joe and Adrian, are developing in the Lenape Hoking, um, and and we now have two MSW interns that are interning in the Lenape Center to move that the center's work. Um, forward and to work side by side, even behind the indigenous community, um, to really claim and um, you know be on this land. So, it it, it, it land acknowledgement. It, it, we we always emphasize, as Dr. Harris is saying, and I can't say it enough. I say it to my students every week in class, is not just a bunch of words. Right. If there's one thing I've learned from Adrian um, and the indigenous community is that the action, the education, the environmentalism, the way that we are looking at reparations um, is not is not giving back land. It really isn't. Right. And that's important. It's not giving back something that already is owned and um, should be recognized as the land of our indigenous um, brothers and sisters. So we work towards it. We work towards it. Absolutely. And, and we have to examine our own assumptions about using terms like decolonizing social work yeah, and yeah. what decolonizing means, which has come up recently. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, an, someone asked, do you have any recommendations on podcasts, books, or speakers for the general public to start learning about decolonization and social work or how to participate in the action plan against anti-Black racism? So resources, things that you want to point people towards right now? So many. <laughs> I know. So just many. pick one. Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, I, I think for white folks, um, Robin D'Angelo's work can be helpful. Um, I think f for um, folks of color, you know, I'm really, I, I'm really a fan of, of Kimberly Crenshaw's work, of um, Patricia Hill Collins' work. I think Baldwin's work. I mean, I think there's, there's, there's so much that we can look at, particularly if we're thinking about um, what Black liberation looks like. Um, so yeah, there, there's so much out there. I think people, folks need to do the work to look and examine. Right, it. Yeah. right. And there's, you know, there's so much we, Jelana and I spent the summer really infusing more around um, uh, how BIPOC, the BIPOC community can be very much a part of anti-Black racism um, and looking at the within group differences. Um, one article that I came across re recently is by Andrea Tambura, including decolonization in social work education and practice. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's from the Journal of Indigenous Social Development. Um, but yeah, and we use a lot of podcasts. The thing about the course, and even the institute that we did, we included different types of ways of learning and engaging. Um, so podcasts and journaling and open mics for each of the classes, um, mentee um, as a way of people uh, sharing their experiences in a different way. Um, so that's all part, I think, of what we're calling decolonizing these spaces in higher ed. Excellent. Um, I guess there's one last question, and actually, I guess I can answer it. It says, if we don't have enough time, can we bring back Dr. Harris and Dr. Williams? And I think absolutely, we would love to have both of you back to talk more about the work that you're doing and what we need to do moving forward. So um, I just want to take this opportunity now to thank you both, Dr. Jelana Harris and Dr. Ovita Williams, for joining us here today at Social Impact Live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For having Thanks us. a lot. Um, it's great. That should conclude um, our episode for today. I just wanted to give uh, a little bit of a um, plug for our show next week. Uh, we have uh, on our show next 
Wednesday, actually we're changing the day to Wednesday, uh, same time, 12 to 12.30, we'll have uh, Desmond Patton and Jarell Daniels uh, to talk about their work um, at the Safe Lab, uh, particularly how social media by urban youth is being targeted by law enforcement um, and a project involving VR that they've been working on to address this. So uh, thank you all for joining, joining us today at our first program uh, of the fall 2020 season. It's great to be back. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.